Father, thank you for being a part of who we are in everyday life. And as we celebrate the birth of the Son of God, God the Son, be with us. We need you desperately, God, to teach us all things. For your word declares your Holy Spirit will lead and guide us into all truth. And he will teach us all things. Helper, we invite you in to do whatever you want in this service. It's yours. Take my mouth, my lips, take our hearts. God, unzip our very flesh off of our spirit just, just for the next 20 minutes, God. May we receive everything you have for us. In Christ's name, amen. 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 I want to share something that I read in my morning devotion. It just it really revolutionized my thought process for today's service. I didn't know what I was going to teach. I didn't want to teach the same thing from yesterday. According to scripture, Christ was born during the harvest. The, the shepherds were in the field, which going back then, month by month, season by season, that would mean that Lord Jesus was born in September, October-ish. We celebrate in December, late December. Now, why would we celebrate December, what happened in quite possibly September? You're going to love this. I loved it when I read it. Did you read it this morning, Marty? What, was it great or was it not? We celebrate the conception, the beginning of life. We celebrate here the conception. Quite possibly, let's for argument's sake say it was sometime in late December, the Holy Spirit appeared to a, quite possibly they say, a 14 or 15 year old young girl. And he said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will have a son and you shall call his name Jesus. You okay, love? You all right? I couldn't stand yeah, yeah, take your time. You're okay. Sorry. Don't be. Happens to all of us. Happens to me a lot. We celebrate what has begun in the heart. And I loved Mary's response when the Holy Spirit came upon her. She said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Basically to say, Whatever you say, may it come to pass in my life. The beginning of life started with a flicker of light in the heart. It started with the thought that, not that door, she wants to go through that door. She's gonna get stuck outside there. <laughs> Marty, help her out there. The life-giving being who, beyond all things, came into our death to give us life. The conception, of his life, which, I mean, the commentary on life itself for us, why we are pro-life, we are, we are anti-abortion, we believe life begins at conception. We believe that. It's a life. We believe. Conception. The question then for us on this Christmas isn't that the most important? Letting the life begin in our heart. Letting the life begin on the inside till it makes its way to the outside. Isn't it the most important? I think we've grown so accustomed to Christianity um, American style. When I was growing up, there was a show. They only showed it late at night. It was called Love American Style. Remember, you guys remember Love American Style? I don't even remember any of the shows. I do. It was like they showed it late at night because it was like a little too risque. Now it would be like totally tame. But Christianity American style proclaims to us that you must look a certain way. You must dress a certain way. You must act a certain way. You must be a certain way. In order for us to find ourselves being good Christians, we look at the way our pastors dress and we dress likewise. We look at the way the, the deaconesses or the pastor's wives dress and we dress that way. We look the way they act. We put fishes on our cars, some doves. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but again, the whole idea of that being so much like everybody else and following, I, 
I so disliked Christianity when I first came to Christ. Not Christ, but Christianity. I thought that I was weird because I didn't want to act the norm. I didn't want to act the part that everybody else was. And I actually thought to myself, well, if this is what Christianity is about, I must have missed it. Because I don't want to be like those guys. I don't want to act like those guys, and I certainly didn't want to dress like those guys. I didn't want to raise my son to be like those guys. Now, I don't want to come off, because when I hear people say negative things about Christianity, it might sound like I'm saying negative things about Christianity, and I'm not. I think Pastor Bob is a manly, strong, God-fearing, God-word-preaching man. It's just not me. I think that, I mean, if we're talking about Chet, if we're talking about anything, I want to be who Christ wants me to be based upon what he's doing in my life. I don't want to find a man who's like me and pattern my life after him. Ken Graves, for some of you guys. Ruth Graham, for some of you ladies. I want, more than anything else, to be exactly how and what God wants me to be. Do you agree with that? Listen to this story of what God did in this woman's heart. I find this absolutely amazing. And a commentary. Verse 3, chapter 14, the book of Mark. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Please give me your attention. The Lord Jesus visiting his friend Simon the Tanner. A woman comes in the house, as was the custom then. And she had a, a flask, what we would call a jar. It was clay, it was sealed. And in it was oil of spikenard. Spikenard was a very fragrant, very expensive. Actually, you're going to see that it cost about 300 denarii, which was about the salary of a year. Now, some would suggest that this oil of spikenard was her dowry, awaiting for a man to be her husband. The best women had wealthy fathers. You married her, and you got that dowry to get your life started. Are you with me? She found something. Something happened in her heart. She only had met the Lord. It's not like she knows, but something happened radical. She wasn't giving it a shot. She wasn't trying it out. It wasn't, well, can I still do this, or can I still do that? It was all in with this girl. As a matter of fact, so sure, so positive she was, she took that dowry. Quite possibly all she had left. Some would suggest that this was Mary Magdalene. Some would suggest it was a prostitute. Someone would suggest that it was Mary, the sister of uh, Martha. Thank you. Either way, she wasn't a kid. It's quite possibly it was her last shot. She had, at least I got this. For me, and I'm telling you a little bit of testimony so that maybe you can relate. I remember thinking to myself when I went to church for the first time and got saved. Not the first time I went to church, but when I got saved for the first time. I felt so guilty because I had painted myself into the proverbial corner. I even remember Bugs Bunny running through my head. Bugs Bunny one time in one of his cartoons is painting the room. And he's in the corner because he painted everything else and he's like stuck in the corner because he painted himself into the corner. And I remember thinking to myself, this is my life. I didn't come to God when I was wealthy. I didn't come to God when I was good looking. <laughs> Never was going to happen anyway. Didn't come to God when I was strong. My strength was gone. My power was gone. I came to him, and here's was my words. I got nothing left. Would you take me? 
Does anybody know that? Yeah. I got nothing left to give you. And it bothered me because I knew I should have given him my strength. I should have given him my purity. I should have given him my money. I should have given him my power. When I had those things, that was the time to come to the Lord. That was my vision. And how we bring our worldly viewpoint to church and think the guys that are special are the guys that are strong and powerful and wealthy. I remember in one of Chuck Smith's books called Effective Prayer Life. I think now it's called Prayer Our Wonderful. They changed it, they expanded it. What's the name of the book you guys just went through? Our, Our Wonderful Privilege? Our Glorious Privilege. They expanded it. I remember reading it for the first time and he talked about how when you get to heaven, there's going to be mansions, giant mansions, and you're going to look at them and go, wow, Billy Graham must live in that one. No, that's uh, Henrietta Smith. Who? Henrietta Smith. Who's that? Oh, she sat in the back of the church. Nobody ever knew her name. And she stayed in the same church for 50 years and prayed for that pastor and that congregation every single day. And that's what God values. I remember thinking, oh man, this is just... The, the con- contradiction going on in my heart at the time, especially first coming to the Lord, it's like, man, I just... I don't want... I don't want recognition. I don't want... Uh, I just want purpose in my life. And I'll never forget what was going on inside of my heart was not what was going on inside of my head. For what was going inside of my heart was the same thing as this woman. Again, verse uh, um, 3 again. And being in Bethany, he was at the house of Simon the leper. As he sat down at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask, a very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask, poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they criticized her sharply. Sharply they criticized this woman who broke, I mean, think about it, from a perspective of finances, I mean, if you have the gift of uh, administrations, oh, what are you doing? Do you know how much our rent costs here? What are you doing? Oh, come on. And we forget about that. We get so sometimes focused on what we think we're supposed to do, we forget that it is our dedication to God that gives us the strength to go out and do the things we're supposed to do. We wound up either worshiping the blessings instead of the blesser or the ministry instead of the minister. Told a long time ago, I think it was Kenny Ingalls, my old pastor from Calvary Fort Lauderdale, he said to me, Ryan, don't ever forget that God is far more interested in the minister than the ministry. And I thought, that's a good word for me. Just, just to know that, and, and I know we, we reiterate this often, but, and I don't want to sound negative, but bigger is not better. Not in God's economy. Not in ministry. Small church can be just as lousy. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Don't break that jar. We could, you know what we could have done with that? We could have given it to the poor. We could have taken, you know how many people we could have taken care of? But Jesus said in verse 6, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. And I want you to know that the language that he speaks there is not a sharp rebuke. It's a smooth reprove. He doesn't go, hey, hey, leave her alone. He doesn't do that. And I love the way the original text reads where it it is smooth. He says, says, you've got a good heart. I like it. You're thinking right thoughts, but relax on the girl. Remember, she's a part of the body. Go easy. Just as gentle in his rebuke sometimes as he was in his, in his love. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, 
you do not always you do not have always she has done what she could she has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial assuredly I say to you wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her <laughs> it started in the heart it was a spark it was a sense it was something but for her it wasn't curiosity. For her, it wasn't a television commercial. For her, it wasn't because her boyfriend took her. For her, it wasn't because if she didn't do it, she wasn't going to be able to live in the house. She went to Christ because she sensed the freedom. For her, Christmas, the conception of life, was all in, man. All in. It was all in. All in. He's, she's all in. From now on, I'm not a housewife anymore. I'm a Christian housewife. From now on, I'm not a fighter. I'm a Christian fighter. From now on, I'm not filling you. I am this. And if God should call me out of it, I'm all in. Oh, wait a second. Well, you got to save up because you got to still be wise and... Nothing. I save nothing anymore. I give my whole life up for this thing now. Everything. Oh, come on, bro. Every Friday, that's our night. We go out, we hang out. Not anymore. Not anymore. Why? Well, the church feeds the homeless on Friday night. Feed the homeless? Are you kidding me? Conception. The light. Let me put this all together for you. For some of us. Don't let this world permeate your thoughts about your Christianity. If you sense, if you see, if you experienced the Lord in your heart, let it all go up. Let it all go up in flames. Let your heart be set on fire for God so that nothing matters anymore. Don't look at people around you in this church or people around you in another church and think, well, you, you got to go easy with this thing. You know, you don't all in. And if God opens the door for you to go to Africa, Iran, Indonesia, places where people are being killed for their witness to Christ, go. Go. What are you waiting for? What do you got here? I got to sell my truck first? Leave it here. We'll sell it. We'll give the money to the poor. <laughs> Christmas. The conception of life. The, the spark that sets the flame. I encourage you all to let that happen. Don't be afraid. The Bible says, the Lord Jesus doing the speaking, truly, for he who finds his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake and the gospel truly finds his life. Or quoting somebody a lot less in stature in my heart, William Wallace. Every man dies. Not every man truly lives. There's so many things to do. Not enough time to do it all. Let's pray. And Father, we thank you for the conception of life, God, and for a young girl 2,000 plus years ago who said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord who is all in with the first glimpse of the Holy Spirit and I think about this young girl who's she knew her life was going to be horrible from there on in she knew it she knew for your spirit told her that a sword would pierce her very heart and that all would laugh at her and call her names even her husband had to bear the shame of a pregnant girl before he even touched her. And she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. 
so too I say, and I do pray for my brothers and sisters out of here, that they would say, Behold, servant of the Lord. David wrote, As a mistress looks to the hand of her maidservant, so as those who look to the dawn, we wait for you. We love you, God. Fall upon our hearts and minds this Christmas. May we take this walk more than serious. May we not just be a Christian on Wednesday or Sunday. Set us on fire, God. Consume us as we sang. May the reality of that song burn through us from the inside out. We ask it by the power of your blood, awesome and mighty King. Amen. Amen. Amen.